Hello, and welcome, today we have two videos, both of which relate to the Scream movie franchise. In the first story, we're off to sunny Idaho, and tell the story of Cassie Joe Stardat. Cassie Jo was born on the 21st of December, 1989, in Percatello, Idaho. She lived with her mother, Anna, and her stepfather, she had an older sister, Christy, and a younger brother, Andrew. She was described as a typical teenager, with a love for music and drawing. She was a responsible, straight-A student, with a lot of friends. On the night of September 22nd, 2006, Cassie was looking after the home of her aunt and uncle, Alison and Frank Contreras, on Whispering Cliffs Drive, in Banna County. Cassie had been hired for the weekend to take care of her aunt and uncle's cats and dogs while they were away. Cassie invited over her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, who arrived at the house around 6 p.m. Later, classmates Brian Draper and Tori Adam Chick, both 16 years old, came over to hang out with the couple. Cassie gave the group a tour of the house, which included showing them the basement, then, they headed up to the living room to watch a movie. Brian and Tori decided to leave before the movie ended, but Matt stayed behind with his girlfriend. Cassie was unaware that before the boys had left the house, Brian had unlocked the basement door, so he and Tori could return to the house undetected. The two boys left, leaving Matt and Cassie Jo to have a nice romantic night together, just the two of them. But the nice quiet night that they had planned wouldn't last long, as within a few hours, Brian and Tori had returned to the neighborhood. Brian and Tori parked their car further down the street from the house, then put on costumes consisting of dark clothing, gloves and white masks. They made their way back to the house, and re-entered the property through the basement door. Unaware of this, Cassie and Matt sat upstairs in the living room, watching TV. Tori and Brian intentionally made noises and moved furniture in an attempt to lure the couple down into the basement. This didn't work. So they found the circuit breaker and turned the power off, hoping they would come down to check the breaker. Again, Cassie and Matt didn't go down to the basement. I can't say I blame them either. Cassie became uneasy and freaked out with all the noises and the power outage. I'd be shiting bricks. Even more so when one of the dogs kept staring down the basement stairs, barking and growling. Matt called his mother and asked if he could stay the night with Cassie as she was nervous with all the weird things going on. Matt's mother refused but said Cassie could come and stay with them for the night, and she would return her to the house the next morning. Cassie politely refused, feeling it was her responsibility to take care of the animals. At approximately 10.30pm, Matt's mother picked him up, leaving Cassie all alone in the house. The house is like a scene from Poltergeist and you just leave your girlfriend all alone. On his way home, Matt called Tori, to see where he and Brian were, wanting to meet up and hang out later with them. Tori answered, but Matt could barely hear him, as he was whispering, he assumed the pair were still at the movie theater. Little did he know, they were creeping around, down in the basement where Cassie was. Down in the basement, Tori and Brian, dressed in black gowns and white masks, again, turned the power off from the circuit breaker. Again, Cassie didn't come down into the basement. I would have been long gone, I'd have taken the animals and booked it. Brian and Tori, both armed with knives, started climbing the basement stairs. Brian was slamming doors at the top of the stairs to scare Cassie, who was lying on the sofa. They then entered the living room and brutally stabbed her over 30 times. Cassie died from her injuries, 12 of the 30 wounds she suffered were potentially fatal. There should be no odds against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but 
You know, hell, protection. hell. You restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. We found our victim, and sad maybe, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? It's 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just God. killed Cassie. Oh. Oh, fuck. That felt like fucking real. Uh, I mean, it went by so fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. Two days later, Cass's family returned home to Whispering Cliffs Drive. Upon entering the house, Cass's 13-year-old cousin was met with the horrific sight of Cass's body on the living room floor, covered in blood. Police were called, and they quickly sealed off the area. As Brian and Tori were with Cassie earlier that night, detectives soon called to question the pair. They said that they went to hang out with Cassie and Matt, but soon realized it wasn't a party, so left after two hours. They then said they went to the movie house, but none of them could remember any details about the movie or what happened in it. Police became suspicious of this, and on September the 27th, after hours of interrogation, Brian Draper finally admitted to the murder and confessed to everything. He then took officers to where him and Tori had dumped the items they had used in the murder. Amongst the items were several knives, gloves, a mask, a videotape, and a partially burned handwritten letter. Which parts of it read, Is home alone? Stop out the house. Runs into Tori. We murder Cassie. Brian chases her. I kill her. Investigators found that Brian and Tori had planned to murder Cassie for weeks. They had documented their murderous plan on videotape, which was shown at their trial. At the trial, the prosecution revealed that Brian was obsessed by the Columbine High School massacre. Tori, however, was said to have been inspired by the screen horror movie franchise. On April the 17th, 2007, Brian Draper was found guilty of first-degree murder for killing Cassie Jo. On June the 8th, 2007, Tori Adam Chick received the same guilty verdict. On August the 21st, 2007, each received a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. Plus 30 years each for conspiracy to murder. Both appealed their sentences taking their appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, but both were denied. The pair are serving their time at Idaho State Correctional Institution, where they will spend the rest of their lives. Next, on to Florida, and look at the murders of five students that actually inspired the film screen. In the early morning hours of Friday, the 24th of August 1990, at the University of Florida, in Gainesville. An apartment, shared by 17-year-old freshman Sonia Lawson and Christina Powell, was broken into. The intruder found Christina asleep downstairs on the couch. He stood and watched her for a while, but did not wake her. Choosing instead to go to the upstairs bedroom, where Sonia was also sleeping. The intruder murdered Larson, first taping her mouth shut to stifle her screams, then stabbing her to death. She died trying to fend him off. The intruder then went downstairs, he woke Christina at knife point, then taped her mouth shut. He bound her wrists together behind her back and threatened her with the knife as he cut her clothes off. He then forced her to lie face down on the floor where he raped her, then stabbed her five times in the back. He posed his victims in provocative positions before taking a shower and leaving the apartment. Sounds like a complete weirdo to me. 
After a few days of not being able to contact the girls, Christina's parents arrived at the complex. With the aid of the manager of the complex and the police, they broke down the door and the girls were discovered. The day after Sonia and Christina were murdered, the apartment of Christer Hoyt was broken into. The intruder pried the door open with his hunting knife. Finding she was not home, he waited in the living room for her to return. At around 11 p.m., Christer returned and was grabbed from behind. After being subdued, her mouth was taped shut and she had her wrists bound behind her back. She was led into the bedroom where her clothes were cut off her and she was raped. She was forced to lay face down on the floor where she was stabbed in the back with such force it ruptured her heart. The intruder left the apartment but fearing he left his wallet there, he returned a short time later to retrieve it. While he was there, he decided to decapitate Christer. He placed Christer's head on a shelf that was facing the body just to make it more shocking for whoever would discover her corpse. This guy is definitely a weirdo. When Christer failed to show up for work the next day, police were alerted to do a welfare check. When they checked her apartment, they found her body. By now, the murders had gained the attention of the media and students became extra vigilant. Some students even changed schools, they were that concerned. Two days after Christer was murdered, the same intruder broke into the apartment of Tracy Pauls, who was 23 years old, and her roommate Manny Tabolder, also 23. He used the same method of prying the sliding door open with his hunting knife. He found Manny asleep in one of the bedrooms, and after a struggle with the young man, he managed to kill him. After hearing the commotion, Tracy attempted to barricade herself in her bedroom, but the door was quickly broken down. Tracy was bound and gagged, her clothing was cut off, and then she was raped. The intruder then laid her down and stabbed her in the back, killing her. The intruder then posed Tracy's body in a provocative position and left the apartment. Their bodies were found the next morning. Police had little to go on and very few leads, although they did have a suspect. 18-year-old Ed Humphrey, who had been arrested and charged with assaulting his grandmother. They had received several tips pointing to Humphrey, who was also known to carry knives. He had visible scars on his face from a car accident and had been off his medication for a mental health disorder at the time of the murders. Humphrey was arrested days after the murders and was being held in jail. When investigators searched his home, they found magazines in his bedroom about knives, guns and girls. A break came when the Louisiana Police Department alerted the Florida authorities to an unsolved triple murder in Shreveport in November the previous year. There were striking similarities between the Gainesville murders and those of 55-year-old William Grayson, his 25-year-old daughter, Julie, and her 8-year-old son, Sean. The family had been attacked in their home as they were preparing dinner. Julie's body had been mutilated, cleaned, and posed. Don Maines, an investigator on their case, traveled to Shreveport because of the similarities between the murders. They included posing of the victims, the tape residue on the bodies were the same, and vinegar was used to clean the bodies. And after testing bodily fluids that was found at all of the murder scenes, experts said the blood type for the perpetrator was type B. Humphreys, the main suspect in the case, was blood type A and was instantly ruled out. Shortly after Maine's trip to Shreveport, Cindy Jurisic contacted Crime Stoppers and reported that an acquaintance of her husband could be connected to the murders in both cities. The man's name was Danny Rowling. She said he used to come over to visit her then-husband, Steve Dobbin. And they became increasingly worried about some of the comments he made. One statement being that he liked to stick knives in people. Danny had also told her, one day, I'm going to leave this town, and I'm going to go where the girls are beautiful, and I can just lay in the sun, 
and watch beautiful women all day. Sounds like Danny is a bit pervy, as well as a weirdo. The thought of Danny rolling being connected to the murders haunted her, and it would not let Cindy rest. So, one day, she picked up the phone and told Crime Stoppers that they need to take a look at Danny Rowling. Danny Rowling was born in Shreveport on the 26th of May 1954, to parents James and Claudia Rowling, he also had a brother, Kevin. His father James was a Shreveport police officer who physically abused all members of the family. Throughout his teenage years, he would be arrested for spying on women and robberies. In May 1990, three months before the murders, Rowling would try to kill his father during a family argument, resulting in his father losing an eye and an ear. They sound like a lovely family. The investigators followed up on the Rowling tip and began an investigation. They found that Rowling had been arrested on the 7th of September 1990 for a robbery at the Winn-Dixie Grocery Store in O'Kaler, Florida. The robbery had been committed 10 days after Paul's and Tabolder's bodies were found. Rowling was being held in the Marion County Jail, which was 40 miles south of Gainesville. As part of investigation, investigators determined that Rowling had type B blood. When he had a tooth extracted whilst in jail, detectives used it to match the DNA to that found at the murder scenes. It was a match. Danny Rowling's tent was also found, pitched beside the university, where the murders took place. Inside the tent, they found audio tapes, narrated by Rowling, detailing the accounts of each murder. In November 1991, Rowling was charged with several counts of murder. He was brought to trial nearly four years later. He pleaded guilty to all charges, and his motive was that he wanted to become a superstar, like Ted Bundy. He got his wish when on April 20, 1994, when just like Ted Bundy, he was sentenced to death. Rowling spent 12 years on death row and was put to death on October 25, 2006, by lethal injection. Thanks for watching, let me know your thoughts below, and give me a like and subscribe if you think I'm worthy enough, as I will post true crime videos weekly, see you in the next video.